Welcome back to the exciting book of Genesis. Hallelujah. We're moving right along, y'all. We're in chapter 34 today. Yeah. Hallelujah. All right. That being said, let's jump right in. Let me have my first reader read Genesis 34, 1 through 5, please. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shisham, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her, and lay with her, and defiled her. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel, and spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shisham spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field. And Jacob held his peace until they were come. Hallelujah. Okay, let's take a look at some of these terms and see what they mean. Uh, Dinah speaks to a judge. You know, uh, a daughter is the apple of one's eye. Leary means weary, um, specifically weary-eyed. Shechem speaks to the neck or the place of burdens. Hamor speaks to a male buttocks. And a high bite speaks to a living place or a villager. And defiled is Anah, number 6031, meaning to depress or to deal hardly with force. You know, or deal hardly with or force someone into something. You know, and so here it is. Essentially, we have this, um, this, this picture of Dinah, the daughter uh, of Yaakov and, and Leah going out, you know, and here it is, Shechem, or the place of burdens, you know, takes her, defiles her. Now, for those who have spiritual eyes to see, I pray that you can see this. You know, but what we actually have here is a spiritual pick of the priesthood in the temple who was ruling over the land. Um, and it's actually a foreshadow of what would happen or a prophecy even, if you would, of what would happen uh, of them actually taking and defiling judge, the judgment of Israel. Now, Dinah, which, who name means judge, now when we, when we put that together with Shechem, who actually took her. Shechem is the place of burdens. You know, now, you have to understand what um, the burden is, scripturally speaking, speaks to the word of Elohim. You know, and so, the place of burdens, or the place of the word of Elohim is his temple. You know, and uh, as it spoke of Hamor, or Hamor, you know, uh, his father, his name means Mel Buttocks, you know, which spoke to the burden bearer. You know, which were the priesthood. We went over this uh, last week as well. So, you know, this is just a refresher. You know, and so here it is. You have a spiritual picture of the place of burdens, that, i.e., the temple, the male buttocks, that is, the priest, the Hivite, who actually lived there, you know, and was ruling, the prince of the country was ruling over the country, even as the the priests were ruling over over Yahudim, over the Yahudim during that during the time of our, during biblical times. You know, and so you just have a spiritual picture of the priesthood in the temple who was ruling over the land, actually taking and defiling the judgment of Israel. <coughs> Let me have my next reader Read um, Genesis 34, 6 through 12, please. And Hamar, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out to, of the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved, and they were very wroth, because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. And Hamar communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter, I pray you give her to him, her him to wife, and make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. 
and ye shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade ye therein, and get you possessions therein. And Shechem said unto her father and unto her brethren, Let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me I will give. Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as ye shall say unto me. But give me the damsel to wife. Okay, so here it is. We have Hamor, the father of Shechem, going to Yaakov to commune with him. And his son's coming out of the field when they heard it. You know, and here it is, he's communicating that the soul of his son longer for your for his daughter, you know, and of course, you know, this is in, in symbolism, this spiritual symbolism, you have um the the temple, the place of burdens longing for judgment, you know, to become one with the judgment of Israel. And, you know, that actually did happen in, in a way. You know, and says in verse 9, and make ye marriages with us, and give us your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you, so we, we can become um, one people, you know, and Shechem is asking, you know, uh, whatever you want, just, you know, you can ask never so much dowry and gift, you know, the word ask is rabbi, means to increase, you know, you can ask over and above what's, what the normal amount is, you know, I realize I've done wrong, you know, uh, never so much is meo number 3966 meaning vehemently so you can you know you can get crazy with it just you know just tell me what you want we're gonna provide it and you know and just let me have her you know so and now keep in mind the spiritual picture is you know they want the judgment of Israel mm -hmm. you know now uh, let's continue on to verses 13 through 17 my next reader please and the sons of Jacob answered, answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, deceitfully, and said, Because he hath defiled Dinah, their sister, and they said unto them, We had, we cannot do this thing, to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. But in this will we consent unto you, if you will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised, then will we give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter, and we will be gone. Hallelujah. Okay, so the plot thickens. You know, first of all, in verse 13, we were told that the sons of Yaakov answered, but they answered deceitfully, right? Yeah. You know, and so, uh, and they said, you know, because he had defiled Dinah, their sister, you know, we can't do this. You have to become, you have to be circumcised like we are. You know, if you will be as we, that every male of you be circumcised, you know, then we will become one people. But if you hearken not unto us to be circumcised, we'll take our daughter and we'll be out of here. We'll, we'll go. You know, now, it's an important um, um, thing to keep in mind, you know, concerning the circumcision. And it's found in Genesis 17, 11. It says, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. You know, so when one was circumcised, that became a token of the covenant between them and Elohim, you know, concerning the the uh, blessing of Abraham, you know. So, you know, this is why this becomes a big issue, you know, in the Brit Kadashah, in the New Testament. You know, you have to remember that circumcision is the token of the covenant. It's the sign of the covenant between Yah, um, Yah and the ancient Israelites. Okay. Moving right along, we have our next reader read verses 18 through 24. And their words pleased Hamar and Shechem, Hamar's son. And the young man deferred, deferred not to do the thing because he had delight in Jacob's daughter. And he was more honorable than all the house of his father. And Hamar and Shechem before came 
through the gate of their city. He communed with the men of their city, saying, These men are people with us, therefore let them dwell in the land and trade therein, for the land is full, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives, and let us give them our daughters. Oh, herein will, only herein will the men consent unto us for to dwell with us to be one people. If every man, male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised, shall not their cattle in their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? Only let us consent unto them, and they will dwell with us. And unto Hamar and unto Shechem his son hearken, all that went out of the gate of his city, and every male was circumcised, all that went out of the gate of his city. Hallelujah. Okay, so the plot thickens again. You know, so here it is. You know, they take the words of Yaakov's sons and they go back and try to sell it to their community. You know, it says in verse 18 the words, please Hamor and Shechem, um, Hamor's son. You know, and so he deferred not to do the thing. Because he had like Yaakov's daughter, and he was more honorable than all the house of his father. You know, just like, uh, um, you know, Yah had chose to put his name, you know, in, in uh, the tribe of Yahuda, in Jerusalem. And hence, it became more honorable than all the rest of the places of Israel. You know, now, it, he sells the story to his brethren, and they, they go for it. You know, now... Here's the thing. This is where the plot thickens because they wasn't totally uh, honest either. They had an ulterior motive as well, and it's and it's, it jumps out at us in verse 23. You know, hence <laughs> Shechem says, "Shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours?" So this is the incentive for them to to buy into it. Only let us consent to them, and they will dwell with us. You know, so, you know, they may not have been totally honest uh, themselves. And remember, they started off with rape. Mm -hmm. You know, so, continuing on, um, verses 25 through 31, my next reader, please. And it came to pass on the third day, when they were sore, the two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. And they slew Hamor and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and that which is in the field and all their wealth, and all their little ones, and their wives took they captive, and spoiled even all that was in the house. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me, and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. And they said, should he deal with our sister as with an harlot? Hallelujah. Okay, so uh, this story essentially foreshadows the destruction of the temple and its priesthood depicted by Hamor, the male buttocks and shepherd in the place of burdens. You know, and we're going to take a look at its, um, at, uh, its fulfillment. You know, I just wanted to point out a couple of things, you know, that, that, that hints that, you know, something more behind the scenes if you would you know when we look at um chapter 20 i mean verse 26 you know we see it speaks of hamor and shechem you know but it's it speaks of um there's an olive top there that doesn't get translated you know and we spoke about the olive top um before whereas uh you know oftentimes the translators didn't know what to do with it you know and and um they say it points to the direct object, you know, but sometimes it doesn't, 
you know, and sometimes they just don't know what to do with it, and so it just doesn't get translated at all. And this is like one of those times, you know, but when you realize that the Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet and the Tav is the last, you know, and you realize what the Messiah said, that he is, um, in the Greek, he says the Alpha and Omega, which in the, in the Hebrew would translate to the Aleph and the Tav, you know, then you begin to see, you know, uh, what it really represents, and that is our Messiah. You know, and so when you start, when you, you see the Aleph Tav before Hamar and the Aleph Tav before Shechem, then, you know, um, you also see that they, that there's more than meets the eye. You know, there's a spiritual significance behind this Hamor and Shechem. You know, hence, they're Yahshua's Hamor and Yahshua's Shechem. You know, and of course, it's, um, where it's speaking to the temple and the priesthood. You know, as well as the spiritual aspect of it. And I'm going to try to show, like, uh, the spiritual uh, fulfillment, you know, that happened in the Brit Kadashah. You know, in order to see this, you have to uh, recognize that the Ecclesia was uh, depicted in, in the Brit Kadashah or the New Testament as feminine, as a, uh, a prospective bride of Messiah, amen? You know, and, you know, so the Messiah was, was also called their brother. You know, so spiritually speaking, you know, it fits the mold. You have you have a uh, a sister of of Yahuda or a Yahudum the Yahudum, our Messiah is the Yahudum, he's the main one, he's the the true praiser of Yah, amen. And you know, and you have his prospective bride, the Ecclesia, you know, and she is going to get taken and defiled. Mm. You know, let's um you know, now that I gave you the precursor, let's take a look. Um, we're gonna take a look at Acts 5, 17 through 20. Um, and then we're gonna jump down to verses 26 through 29, my next reader, please. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which in the sect of Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of Adonai, by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence. They feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they sent them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in the name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood, this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other other apostles answered and said, "We ought to obey Elohim rather than men." Hallelujah. Okay, so here it is. We have the high priest, you know, Hamor, you know, the the male bat buttocks, uh, and we have all they that were with him, which is the sect of Sadducees, and were filled with, with um, indignation. And we're told that they were at Jerusalem, you know, which is the place of burdens, you know, that's where the temple was, you know, and if we look at the Ecclesia, you know, as a type of diner, you know, because the Messiah left them with, to be the judges of the kingdom of Elohim, you know, hence he gave the keys to the kingdom to Kephas or Peter, I mean, you know, and here it is, we see they're actually taking them, you know, it says, uh, uh, where does it say it? But the angel, da, 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 da. they laid, verse 18, and they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. So they literally, you know, um, did take them, you know, but the angel of uh, the Adonai by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, go stand in the temple to the people all the words and speak to uh, in the temple to the people all the words of his life you know so then went to captains and they brought brought with them out we fast forward you know and we see that the that they brought the people out and they're asking them well why did you do this you know we did we didn't we command you not to do this you know you're gonna fill all of Jerusalem with your doctrine you know and 
of course, keepers and other apostles answered, we ought to obey Elohim rather than men. You know, but we see there, you know, they did take Dinah. They did take the ecclesia, you know, and the thing is, is after they, after they took them, you know, they began, you know, when they seen that they couldn't overcome them, you know, they want, their souls began to long for them, even as Shechem's soul longed for Dinah, and they wanted to become one with them, you know, and so what did they do? They became one with them. How did they become one with them? That they, um, that was by infiltrating them, infiltrating them, you know, and so uh, we see evidence of this throughout the Brick Kadashah, in Acts 15, 1 through 5, it says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moshe, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Now, we see, you know, this is the council that was in Jerusalem, so we see Dinah here, she truly was judging, you know, and they became one with the judgment of Elohim, you know, as, as you're going to see. And it says in verse 3, and being brought on their way by the, by the church, they passed through Phineas and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the, of the ecclesia and another of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that Elohim had done with them, but there rose up certain of the sect of Pharisees. Now, um, you know, and it says, which believe, saying that it is needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moshe. So what I want you to see is how Shechem was, had longed to become one with him so much so that he had violated them by infiltrating them and began to insert their influence over the apostles, you know, and so this is what we see going on here in Acts 15 with Apostle Paul. You know, they're going against what Apostle Paul is actually teaching and teaching something else and confusing the people, you know, and take note in verse 1 it says, and certain men which came from where? Judea. Again, you know, um, we see Shechem, you know, who who uh, name means the place of burdens, and of course Judea was the place of burdens, and in, in that it was where the temple was located and where the priesthood was located, you know. And and verse five of Acts 15 says, and there rose certain other sect of Pharisees. So now we see who these certain men were. They were of the sect of Pharisees. So we see that uh, the priest sent the Pharisees to infiltrate, to infiltrate the ecclesia, you know, and defile them from within. You know, and so it says, but there rose up certain other sect of Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moshe. Now why were they so adamant about getting them to keep the law of Moshe? And this is this is essential if you're gonna understand what Paul is talking about in Galatians. You know, because if you don't understand, you know, what the um, circumcision represented, which what we um, we just went over, which is the the signal or distinguishing mark of the old covenant. You know, so especially in their day and time, see, and that's something when people consider these scriptures, they don't, they oftentimes don't take themselves back to that day and time. But if you go back to that day and time, then you see that the the, the priesthood and the Pharisees they were in power. You know, just like. Just like in the story, just like in the story with Shechem and Hamor, and it said that they were the prince over all their country, they were in power. And so who were they in power over? They were in power over those of the circumcision. They were in power over those who had who um who was adhering to the law of Moshe. Hence they wanted them to command them to keep the law of Moshe. Can you see this? You know, because in doing so, that would have gave them authority over them, and they could prove it. How could they prove it? Easy. They would tell the men, drop your drawers. Mm -hmm. See, he's circumcised. He's one of us. You know, and that would be their evidence. You know, and they could show scripture say, see, this is the sign of the covenant. Mm -hmm. See, but, you know, a lot of times that get overlooked. 
you know, but this is what gave them authority or would have given them authority over the Gentiles who, if they weren't circumcised, they would have no way to prove that they had authority over them. You follow me? Yeah. You know, now, Paul, in talking about this very same thing in Galatians 2, 4, and 5 says, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in. See, you know, Acts don't just speak about this. Paul speaks about it in Galatians. Uh, he, he calls them false brethren, unawares brought in. And because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Mashi Mashiach, Yahushua, that they might bring us into bondage. How would they bring them into bondage? Because if they got them to be circumcised, then they were bound to keep Torah. And if they wasn't keeping Torah, they had the authority to, to, um, to bring them before the... the uh, the, the rulers of Rome and have them be beaten or killed, even like they did our Messiah. Yeah, right. See, you have to understand that they were in power during that time, and their power was directly derived from the law of Moshe. You know, it was centered around the circumcision, especially when it came to the Gentiles, because that's the only way they could prove that they were one of theirs. You know, so. This is what Paul is saying, you know, that they came in privately, privately to spy out our liberty that we have in Mashiach, Yahushua, that they might bring us into bondage. They want to bring you into bondage. Don't fall for it. Verse 5, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. See, now, Apostle Paul is saying that, you know, he didn't pay them any mind. He kept on preaching and teaching the truth that the truth of the gospel might continue with you because they were trying to pervert the gospel. Mm -hmm. That's very that's a very important yeah. point to consider yeah, and to and to remember. You know, so, you know, just like we see with with Hamor and Shechem, they had an ulterior motive. Mm -hmm. right. Now, also, you know, these, these aren't the only two accounts in the Brick Kalasha that speak of these, uh, these cert certain men that came in, you know, that was false brethren. Jude um, speaks of them as well in, in verses 3 and 4 of Jude 1. It says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend. Earnestly contend earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Why? Verse 4, for there are certain men mm -hmm. crept in unawares mm -hmm. who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our Elohim into lasciviousness and denying the only Adonai Elohim and our Adonai Yahushua Mashiach. Amen. I pray that you can see, yeah. you know, that what was happening during that time you know, was that these these men that were Pharisees, were crept into the faith mm -hmm. and began to pervert the faith, began yeah. to defile it, even as Shechem went into uh, Dinah and defiled her. Yeah. You know, they crept in unawares. You know, also, Kephas himself, the head of the ecclesia, he also spoke of these things. In 2 um, Kephas, or 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, it says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there should be yeah. false teachers among you, yeah. who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Adonai that bought them, mm -hmm. and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, mm -hmm. by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoken of. And through covetousness shall they be feigned with words, um, shall they with faint words make merchandise of you mm -hmm. whose judgment now of a long time linger of not and their damnation slumber of not so I want you to be able to see that these folks infiltrated the faith and they began to pervert the gospel mm -hmm. yes. and turn it into something that was defiled oh, yeah. even as Shechem took Dinah and defiled her you know, and they, they did pervert the ecclesia. They perverted the judgment of the ecclesia. And that's what, that's what um, Paul was talking about. You know, here it is, these guys that they were in, in collusion with. You know, here it is, they were saying all this stuff. 
you know, and they were really trying to pervert the truth of Elohim. And so all that Paul was going out amongst the Gentiles and he was building up churches and sowing seed, they were coming back sowing, sowing um, tares amongst the wheat. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be able to see this. You have to be able to understand this because this is very, very important. Now, Genesis 34, 25 says, And it came to pass on the third day that when they were sore that, they, that the two sons of Yaakov, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. Mm -hmm. Now, this is how that played out. This is how it ended, you know. Now, I'm, I'm here to tell you that, you know, during the time of Apostle Paul, and you can see Apostle Paul going at it with him throughout Scripture, you know, but during the time of Apostle Paul as well as Apostle um, Kephas and Apostle James, you know, when, you know, they, they all speak of these, they all speak of these, um, these, these men that crept in unawares that began to pervert the gospel, that began to defile the ecclesia, that be, um, defile the faith, you know, now... Here it is, it takes the sons of Yaakov to destroy him. You know, it takes the sons of Yaakov, even Simeon and Levi, to destroy him. Simeon, you know, which um, means hearing. So it takes one that's hearing from Elohim and Levi, which means attached to, you know, attached to Elohim and attached to the people. So Simeon and Levi, so it's one that hears from Elohim, that's attached to Elohim, but also attached to the people. It takes for them to take up their sword, i.e. the word of Elohim, and go into the faith and destroy those of the circumcision that's causing the problem. You know, now when we look back at history, we see that this truly did happen. We see that they were destroyed, were they not? You know, in 70 AD, the temple word was destroyed, the priesthood was done away with, even as you see in Genesis 34. Hamor and Shechem, you know, were done away with, you know, and it was because they messed with Dinah, mm -hmm. you know, and the same thing with the temple is because they messed with the ecclesia. Yeah. <clears throat> they were done away with. The Messiah had prophesied it, you know, and it came to pass just as he said, yes, you know. Now, I also want you to understand, you know, something from one of the wisest men that walked the earth. You know, uh, that is King Solomon. Yeah. In Ecclesiastes 1, 9 through 11, he says, The thing that hath been, guess what? It is that which shall be. Yeah. And that which is done yeah. is that which shall be yeah. done. And there is no new thing yeah. under the sun. Yeah. Right. Is there anything whereof it may be yeah. said, see, this is new? Nothing. It hath been already of all time yeah. which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. Yeah. You know, you have to know and understand, even as the Word teaches on three different levels, it teaches even as the Messiah, who is the Word, even as he said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever, the Word teaches concerning yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. You know, and so once we understand that, and we understand the wisdom that Paul, that um, that uh, King Solomon has given us. You know that the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. Then we can understand that this is going to happen again. Mm -hmm. And that which is done, um, which was done then, is that which shall be done. Yeah. You know. So I'm saying this because I want to encourage you because it's already done happen. Yes. Yes. You know. Again, the faith has been infiltrated yes. by by false yes. teachers yes. that have spread damnable heresies yes. all through the faith. That's right. And it's up to those of us who are hearing from Elohim and who are attached to Elohim and to the people to go throughout the faith and pull our swords and destroy them. Yeah. Because they pervert the faith. Yes. They lead people yeah. astray. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so the same thing that was is the same thing that is is the same thing that's going to be. And in the end, we always get the victory. Amen. Yeah. 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 All right. You know, seeing that we are on a road, we're going to continue on to Genesis chapter 35. You know, so Genesis 35, 1 through 5, uh, my next reader, please. Oh. 
Oh. And Elohim said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto Elohim that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto Elohim, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of Elohim was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. Hallelujah. Now this is this is also an important lesson to learn, you know, because uh, those of us who are hearing of Elohim and we are attached to him and his people, you know, and we are going out there and we're standing on the front line and we're seeking to destroy those who pervert the faith, yeah. you know, there's a very real threat, you know, because they're not alone. They have a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of um, people that, that's, uh, yeah. that's with them. You know, and so this passage speaks to that, though. You know, it says Elohim told Yaakov, you know, this is what, I, this is what you need to do. You know, because he was afraid because he said, you know, hey, you guys have made me stink amongst the people. Mm. You know, now we're just visitors here. Mm. You know, these, these, you know, these people, you know, they're surrounded, you know, by, by their friends and family. You know, we're, 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 only, we're only visitors in the land. So, you know... Um, they got worried, and so y'all told them to leave, you know, and he said, go to, the, to Bethel. Bethel means the house of Elohim. And he told them to dwell there and make an altar unto Elohim, you know. Now, Yaakov took the instructions, but he knew how, that when he went, he had to come correct. Mm -hmm. And so he told his, his family, you know, even as I'm telling you all, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean. And change your garments. You know, you have to be covered with something that's clean. You know, you have to put away the strange gods. Anything that you're exalting over the word of Elohim has to go. You know, and then we can arise and go to Bethel, to the house of Elohim. You know, and he's telling his, his uh, family that he, he's going to make an altar unto Elohim there. And of course, when you make an altar, you also sacrifice. You know, and so they gave him the strange the strange Elohim that were with them in their hand and all the earrings and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and things that were in their ears and he hit them up under the oak. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, verses 5 and 6 says, So Yaakov came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, that is Bethel, and he and all the people that were with him, and he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there were Elohim, um, because there Elohim appeared unto him, when he fled from the face of his brother. Okay, so Lou speaks to the almond tree. And we spoke about the almond tree before, you know, and, you know, it's, it speaks to, in all actuality, you know, the, the menorah, which was a type of almond tree. And then uh, we have Bethel, which means the house of Elohim, and we have El Bethel, which speaks to the, the El of the house of Elohim, you know, so... Um, now, uh, Revelations 1, 11 through 13, you know, tells us uh, about that almond tree and who it is in reality. Uh, let me have my uh, next reader read Revelations 1, 11 through 13, and then jump down to Revelations 21, 2 and 3, please. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia and unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto per Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia got that one <laughs> 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 and unto 
Pleasia. <laughs> and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and the grit, excuse me, I'm sorry, and the girt about the paps with the golden girdle. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from Elohim out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Elohim himself shall be with them, and be their Elohim. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, so here it is in Revelation 1, 11 through 13, speak about um, the menorah. When you, when, you look at, when you look at the menorah, which uh, uh, Yah told, told Moshe to build, but he remember, he told him to make it in accordance to the pattern in which he showed him. You know, and this is the pattern. You know, uh, we see here the Messiah being the one in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. You know, uh, when we look in Revelations and, and we, we, uh, we're told that the seven golden candlesticks represents the, the seven churches. And so this is, this is what the menorah really typifies. And w when you look at the details of the menorah, you'll notice that it's a almond tree. You know, and so, and it's, it's stationed where? In the house of Elohim. You know, so... This is the uh, true uh, uh, semblance, you know, semblance of, of the menorah, you know. And so here it is. We see that Jacob is coming to the house of Elohim. He's coming to lose the almond tree, you know. And this is where he's going to set up his altar and he's going to offer his sacrifice, you know. And ultimately... You know, it will be in New Jerusalem, you know, New Jerusalem, you know, um, and he, we see in verse 3, says, Behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is with men, and he will dwell with them, you know, and I tell you even today, behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is with men, because scripture teaches us that ye are the tabernacles of Elohim, amen, yeah, you know, yeah. these fleshly yeah. bodies, you know, so make sure that your menorah, that your almond tree is lit. Amen. Yeah. All right, Genesis 35, 8. But Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak, and the name of it was Alam Bakuth. You know, now, this verse right here, this, this verse right here, right here, this one right here, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it just screams at you. You know, um, when you're a student of the word, it just screams at you. It just stands out, you know, um, so, so uh, vibrantly, you know, it just raises a huge flag, you know, because no one's talking about Deborah. No one's talking about Rebecca's nurse. Nobody's, no one's talking about none of, none of this. And all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, you know, here it is. It tells us, but Deborah, Rebecca's nurse died. Really? <laughs> Where, you know, and you're like, where is this coming from? You know, why is this here? And that's exactly what God wants you to think. And then, you know, that's a remass. That's a hint. That's a clue for you to dig deeper to find yeah. out why it is there. Yeah. You know, and what does y'all mean by it? Well, when we look at Deborah, we find that her name actually speaks to bees. You know, Rebecca, you know, which, of course, was the wife of um, Yisak, you know, name speaks to uh, ones that was shackled or ensnared. And, you know, here's the key. The nurse, you know, Re um, Deborah wasn't just anybody. She was, she was Rebecca's nurse. You know, and this word, Yanak, which is translated as nurse, means literally to give milk. You know, and so here it is. We have a spiritual picture of the enemy's milk dying. Or ceasing, you know, and this is exactly what happens. What happened after the Messiah, you know, um, was uh, was resurrected, you know, and all this stuff began to take forth when Dinah began to get uh, um, defiled and all that, that. You know, yes, Rebecca's nurse actually did die. Deborah did die, 
Now, when you understand the spiritual significance of Deborah, then you can see that. Deborah name means bee. So um, I have a few passages here that speaks to bees so that you can understand bees from a scriptural viewpoint. I know everybody has an understanding of what a bee is, but you need to understand what a bee represents in the world of scripture. Amen? You know, because it doesn't matter what we think. If what matters is what scripture thinks. You know, and so when we go to Deuteronomy 144, it tells us, it says, And the Amorites which dwelt in that mountain came out against you and chased you as bees do, and destroyed you in Seir unto Hormah. Now, the Amorites were what type of, um, uh, had what relation to the Israelites? Anyone? They were the enemy. You know, exactly. That's the relationship they had to the Israelites. They were their enemy. You know, Psalms 118, um, verses 10 through 12, all nations compassed me about, but in the name of Yahuwah will I destroy them. They compassed me about, yea, they compassed me about, but in the name of Yahuwah I will destroy them. They compassed me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of Yahuwah I will destroy them. Now, what relationship are these bees to, to the psalmist? The enemy. So again, they're presented as the enemy. And Yeshayahu, Isaiah 7, 18, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that Yahuwah shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost parts of the rivers of Mitzrayim, or Egypt, and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. Now, Assyria was in what relationship to Israel? The enemy. Can you not see that the bees typify the enemies of Israel, you know, scripturally speaking, you know, and surely they do, you know, scripturally speaking, the B signifies the the um the enemies of Israel. Now it says that uh, she was buried beneath the oak of Alam Bakuf, the oak of weeping, you know, and Alam Bakuf means the oak of weeping. You know, let me see now. When we go to uh, First Kephas, we're gonna go to First Kephas or First Peter two, one and two, you know, and it says, "Wherefore laying aside all malice and guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby." Now the reason we're here is because I want you to understand that you know. Babes need milk. Mm -hmm. The milk giver has died. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. You know, the one who was given the milk had died. The, um, the enemy's milk that was being given had died. You know, and when we go to Hebrews 5, 9 through 12, you know, we, re we, we find out, you know, what milk the enemy utilized. You know, and... Let me have my next reader read Hebrews 5, 9 through 12. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called on Elohim and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of Elohim, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Hallelujah. Okay, so now, again, you need to understand something, you know, before we get into this, um, lest you get misconstrued as to what I'm saying, you know. When you spoke to a, when you speak to a Yahudim, a true Yahudim, even now today, and you know as well as in biblical times, and you ask them of Torah, you know, you ask them of Torah, you know, the first thing came to them is which part, you know, and 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 what I mean by which part is Torah to the Yahudim or to to a Jew has two parts. It has a written Torah and an oral Torah, you know, and they uphold the oral Torah over the written. Right. Now, the oral Torah speaks to 
the uh, man-made traditions, mm -hmm. you know, which are which are found in the Mishnah and the um, Talmud and things things of that that nature. You know, now these these oral law, this oral law, um, as aforementioned, you know, were held in higher regard than the written law. And this is the problem that the Messiah had with him, and this is how the enemy utilized it against Yah's people. It was through these man-made traditions, these these man-made fallacies that they thought Yah was, um, they were interpreting the word of Elohim, and they thought that they were embellishing it and, and bringing out what he wanted, you know, but they were actually, you know, doing just the opposite, you know. And so, you know, this is the part of the milk that was poisonous. Yeah. You know, of course, the word of Elohim will nurture the babe. That's right. You know, but this is why Deborah had to die. Mm -hmm. You know, this is why she had to die because the enemy was using was using that. You know, and so here it is in, in Hebrews 5. It says, and he became the altar of eternal salvation unto all them that obeyed him. Now, of course, that's speaking about our Messiah, Yahshua, right? Yeah. You know, who he is the author of our eternal salvation. Now, take note that it says, all who obeys him. That's the key. Yeah. You know, because they have to obey him. Now, it says in verse 11, it says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. So he wants to talk to him of what Yahshua said, you know, but he understands that they are hard of hearing. They're dull of hearing, mm -hmm. you know, and the reason why they're dull of hearing, he tells us in verse 12, he says, for when the time ye ought to be teachers, when you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of Elohim and are become such as have need of milk. So he's likening the milk to the first, first principles of the oracles of Elohim. You know, now, those first principles of the oracles of Elohim is as that milk and in which they are in need of. You know, and... So, he's saying that's what you need, not strong meat. You want to hear about what Yahshua said, but that's, that'd be like, you know, a lot of what Yahshua said was strong meat. Mm -hmm. You know, and even he himself, just, to, just knowing about him was, was bread, because yeah. he was the bread of life, amen? Yeah. You know, like, you're not there yet. You know, I have to start back over with you. Yeah. You know, yeah, you should be teachers, but now you need to go back to the milk. You need to go back to Torah. You know, now, uh, just to, to show that these first principles of the oracles of Elohim is speaking to Torah, let's go to Romans 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, what advantage have the Yahudim? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Verse 2, much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of Elohim. Now, we know what was committed to them was Torah. Amen? You know? Which, is, which he's referring to as the oracles of Elohim, which in Hebrews is being referred to um, those who, who are in need of such um, as those babes that need milk. You know, and then in verse 13 of Hebrews 5, he says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. You know, and you're not going to understand this if you don't understand what righteousness is. You know, and um, I believe it's uh, Deuteronomy 6.15 or 6.25, you know, um, you know that, that, that tells us that Torah, you know, was their righteousness, you know, was to be the righteousness of Israel, you know. And, and so he's saying, you're unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. See, because Yahshua brought a new righteousness. Yes. You know, this is what Yeshayahu 56, 1 is talking about. You know, um, salvation being near to come and his righteousness yeah. to be revealed. Yeah. If it has to be revealed, then that means that they don't already see it. Yeah. Amen? Right. So it was something that his Savior would bring. Yeah. You know, this is why... 
you know, the people of the time, they understood these things, but those of us today, we do not. Right. Yeah. See, they understood, you know, that's, that's why they were grabbing on to Ezekiel and being healed. Mm -hmm. Even because they understood yeah. that scripture says when he come, yeah. you know, that there will be healing in his wings. Yeah. The Ezekiel were his wings. And they represented the commandments of Elohim, the righteousness that he was revealing. Mm -hmm. And so when it says that he grabbed, they grabbed onto the hem of his garment or they grabbed onto to his um to those uh, fringes or to the Zeke seats, and they were healed, it was because they were grabbing on to the commandments, words, and sayings of Yahshua, which will bring healing. You know, because it's going to convert you from the error of your ways. Yes. All right, let me have my next reader read Genesis uh, 35, 9 through 14, please. And Elohim appeared unto Jacob again, and he came unto him and blessed him. And Elohim said to him, Your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. And he called his name Israel. And Elohim said unto him, I am Elohim Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of you, and kings shall come out of your loins. And the land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, to you I will give it, and to your seed after you will I give the land. And Elohim went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. Hallelujah. Okay, so verse 9 told us that Elohim blessed him. What was the blessing? His name. The blessing was, thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called Jacob anymore, Jacob. I call any more Yaakov, but Yisrael shall be thy name. That was the blessing. That was the yes. blessing when he received it the first time, and it's the blessing when he's receiving it again here. You know, here it is. Yah is confirming what the angel he wrestled with had already told him, that his name shall be Yisrael, and that is a blessing. Don't you know that it is a blessing for you to take on the name Yisrael? Yeah. You know, that is a blessing from Elohim. You know, and the understanding that he has given me concerning Yisrael is that it's a compound word, Yisra and El. Yish meaning man, Ra meaning evil, El speaking to Elohim, and he who wrestles with good and evil and prevails by holding on to the good, which is yes. Elohim, yes. shall prevail. That is Yisrael. You know, and so, you know, I implore you to take this blessing and run with it, you know, because... You know, all of us, you know, if we're going to walk this thing out, are going to find ourselves wrestling with yeah. with man and wrestling with Elohim. Man say to do this, that, and the other. Y'all say to do do um, yeah. that, such and such, and the other thing. Right? Yeah. You know, but which one you going to hold on to? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and Elohim said unto him, I am Elohim Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. Now, remember, he's telling them to do what? Be fruitful and multiply. You know, so he has a command right there. That's, you know, that's a directive. He's telling them, be fruitful and multiply. You know, now keep that in mind. Put it on the shelf for a second. We'll pull it down in just a minute. Now, it says that Yaakov set up a pillar in this place and he poured oil upon it. You know, uh, when you pour oil upon something, you know, another word for that is called anointing. So here it is, you know, he set up an anointed pillar. You know, and this anointed pillar or anointed stone um, symbolized our Messiah, Yahushua. Mashiach or Messiah means anointed one. You know, Yahushua was also a stone, you know, um, uh, that came ultimately from Yaakov. You know, uh, First Kephas 2, 6, wherefore also it contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, that he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. You know, and so we see we uh, we do still have that pillar with us now today, amen? amen? We still have that anointed stone, you know, standing as a pillar unto us. We can lean up against it and take refuge behind it whenever we need to, amen? amen. Let me have my next reader read Genesis 35, 16 through 19, please. And they journeyed from Bethel. There was but a little way to come to Ephraim. And Rachel traveled, and she had, hmm? she traveled, 
and she had hard labor. And it came to pass when she was in, when she was in labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, uh, that she called his name the Ben Benani, but his father called him Benj uh, Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in the land Ephraim, which is Bethlehem. Hallelujah! Now this is a very important passage. You know, now here it is in verse 16. It says, "And they journeyed from from Bethel, um, and they journeyed from Bethel." Um, from the house of Elohim, you know, now, after the destruction of the temple, every one of the faith had to journey from Bethel, did they not? Mm -hmm. You know, um, because the house of Elohim was no more, so, um, not in that spot anyway, mm -hmm. you know, so, had to move on. Now, after such, you know, we have the same commandment that was given unto Yaakov. Um, we had just put it on the, on the shelf. What is the commandment, the directive that Yah gave them? Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply, absolutely. You know, that's what we need to do, amen? amen. You know, now, uh, now, now keep that in mind. Now, it says that there was but a little way come to Ephrath. Ephrath, or Ephrath, um, means fruitfulness. Now, you think that's just coincidence that he just told them to be fruitful and multiply and the place that they're heading to means what? Fruitfulness. That is not a coincidence. Okay? That is Yah. That's Yahsa. You know? Now, what happens? Rachel, in the process of being fruitful, dies. You know? Now, you have to be able to get the spiritual picture here because this, this, is, this is huge. Because in verse 18 it says, And it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, mm -hmm. which means son of my sorrows. Mm -hmm. But his father called him Benyamin, which means son of my right hand. Mm -hmm. Who's at the right hand of the father? Yes, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yahshua. Yeah. You know, um, the son of Elohim. Mm -hmm. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephra, which is Bethlehem. Now, Ephra, the fruitfulness, is actually the same as the house of bread. Now, we know who... Bread of life. Absolutely. We, we know who Yahshua is. He, he's the bread of life. And so we know um, if he's the bread, then he lives in the house of bread. Amen? That just makes sense, right? You know? So, this is a spiritual picture that, that we're being shown here. Now, I'm here to tell you Again, Ecclesiastes, I'm going to remind you of the wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiastes 1, 9, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. The same thing that happened then is the same thing that's happening now. You know, and even as Yah told Yaakov to be fruitful and multiply, he also tells us that we need to be fruitful and multiply. Even as Rachel, Rachel whose name means a you, a lamb, you know, even as the Messiah was a lamb, you know, we are supposed to pick up our torture stakes and follow him, amen? Even as he was a lamb, we're supposed to be lambs, and we're supposed to be following him. And his and, and the lamb of Elohim ended up on the altar of Elohim and being sacrificed. So if we are lambs as well, where should we end up? On that same altar being sacrificed, right? You know, and this is why you see in the Brick Kadasha, you know, um, passages such as Romans 12, which says, you know, um, present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto um, Elohim, which is your reasonable, reasonable service. That's just being reasonable. Let's just be reasonable. You know, we're not asking for no extra right now. We just want to be reasonable, right? You know, now, you know, the important thing to see here, though, you know, let, oh, well, let me bring something else out. You know, in Yochanan 3.3, 3, Yahushua answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of Elohim. And the reason I bring this up is because all of us uh, are as a Rachel. You know, all of us are as you lambs, and we're walking this thing out, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, and we all have a commandment to be fruitful and multiply, amen? Yeah. You know, and the point that I'm trying to bring across here is that in order for us to bring forth fruit, the flesh is going to have to die. Yeah. 
I pray that you can see that within this. You know, Rachel had to die. She had to sacrifice herself so that Benjamin could be birthed. This is why she called him ben, ben Oni because it truly was the son of her sorrows, but it was a benefit, you know, to the father. Because even though it was the son of her sorrows, it truly was the son of the right hand. Amen? Hallelujah. You know, and so this is what we become, you know, when our Rachel dies, when the lamb in us is put on the sacrifice, you know, put on the altar and sacrifice. You know, don't think it's by happenstance that you find all these passages, passages concerning sacrifice, like Romans, you know, 12, 1 and 2, you know, speaking of living, being a living sacrifice and other passages such as mortify your members daily. You know, yeah, you, you know, you have to kill the flesh. Yeah. You're not going to make it to fruitfulness with your flesh still alive. Because the thing that have been is it that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. So there's no new thing under the sun, so you can't do it a new way. <laughs> no. See, you can't do it a new way. You can't do you can't do it your way. You know, this is not Burger King. You can't have it your way. Yeah. You know, you got to take it the way it's given. And this is the way Yah has given it. Yeah. You know, this is why the Messiah said, pick up your torture stake and follow him. Well, he wasn't going to have a party when he picked up his. Right. Hmm. See, I want you to know and understand that there's a part of you that have to die in order for yeah. Yeah. you to be father from above. Yeah. In order for Benjamin, the son of the right hand, to be birthed. And if he's not birthed, the Messiah says, you won't be able to see the kingdom of Elohim. Mm -hmm. Everybody still with me? Yeah. Hallelujah. All right, Genesis 35, um, 20 says, And Yaakov set a pillar upon her grave. That is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. You know, he put a pillar there. You know, and I want you to know, and I want you to I want you to get this. I want you to get this 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 good, you know, because you know, not only was there a pillar uh at Bethel, there's a pillar. You know, this word pillar speaks to a memorial stone. You know, it causes someone to remember at Rachel's grave. You know, people at some point or another in your faith walk should be able to see when Rachel died. Are you with me? When you are walking this thing out correctly. Yes. At some point in your faith walk, yes. the people around you should be able to recognize when Rachel died. They should be able to say, hey, I remember when. You don't act like that no more. Because you've become fruitful. Because now you're filled with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, goodness, temperance, faith. You've become fruitful. I can see your flesh has died. I can see you've been fathered from above. I can see that you're walking as the son of Elohim now. The son of the right hand. See, at some point, somebody should be able to recognize that Rachel has died. If not, you're doing something wrong. You can't just... Name it and claim it. Say a few words and, oh, presto, change. Oh, hey, I'm saved. Right. And there's no change in your life. Yes. See, the Messiah says, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. They will change you. They will cause you to become fruitful, to be fathered from above. And it's essential if you're going to enter into the kingdom of Elohim. Never forget the gospel. And so many people, you know, they only, they only preach part of the gospel. They only preach that the Messiah came and died for your sins and was raised three days later. And that's great, and I'm not taking nothing from that. But that's not what the Messiah was preaching when he was walking the earth. That's not what his apostles was preaching and teaching while he was upon the earth. Right. They wasn't going around and saying, hey, come follow us. We found the Messiah. He's about to die for your sins and be raised three days later. That's not what he was saying. Right. He wasn't saying that at all. He was saying, repent yes. for the kingdom of Elohim is at hand. Yes. 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 He didn't say 
and be sorry for the wrong that you're doing. Become converted. Turn and go the other way. Walk in righteousness. That's what this walk is about. If you're the same happy heathen that you were when you said, I do to y'all, that's something wrong. You're doing something wrong. You've been deceived, hoodwinked, yeah. bamboozled, yeah. led astray. Yeah. Yeah. You got to get this thing right. And there's no way that you're going to be father from above without Rachel dying. There's no way you're going to birth a son of the right hand without Rachel dying. There's no way you're going to become fruitful and be father from above without embracing the labor pains of being on knee. The son of your sorrow. I'm just saying, that's, you know, that's what scriptures teach. Genesis 35, 21. And Israel journeyed and spread his tent beyond the Tower of Edar. You know, now, for all of us, all of you trying to walk this thing out, this is, this is really important, too. You know, I hate to be so long-winded, but it is what it is. You know, um, verse 22, and it came to pass, and when Israel dwelt in, in that land, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Yaakov were 12. Now this, this passage here also screams. It screams out, say, hey, understand me. Hey, why? Because this is the first time that the narrative addresses Yaakov as Israel. Mm -hmm. This is the first time that the narrative actually addresses him as Israel. Yeah. You know, if you look at just the, um, the verse before, in verse 20, it says, And Yaakov set up a pillow upon her grave. Mm -hmm. You see that? Yeah. Very next verse, it says, And Israel journeyed. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. You know, and so many people just pass over this like it's nothing. No, it, it's something. It's, it's Yah's way of telling you, you know, hey, check this out. Mm -hmm. Understand this. You know, it says, and he journeyed and spread his tent beyond the Tower of Edar. Now, the Edar, the Tower of Edar means the Tower of the Flock. Edar speaks to the flock. And it says in verse 22, And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land, what land? Beyond the Tower of Edar. Why is it telling us that it was beyond the Tower of Edar? Because it wants you to, uh, to get the picture. Hebrew is a pictorial language. It's drawing a picture for you. You know, now... What you should be seeing is Israel journeying, and he's way beyond, because that word beyond means far, far away from the Tower of Edar. He's far away from the Tower of the Flock. So the towers were, were, were made to be lookouts. So he's far away from where he can actually see the flock. That's the spiritual picture that's being, that's being denoted here. He's far away from being able to see the flock, and something happens. Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard it. Now the sons of Yaakov were 12. Now, you know, what this is telling us is that any time, you know, any time that you stray so far away, you know, like some people say become spiritually minded but no earthly good, any time you stray so far away from the flesh that you can't see it, that you can't Watch over it. Yeah. Then the enemy is going to come in. And how is he going to attack? Who is he going to attack? He's going to attack Bilhah. Bilhah name means fearful. So he's going to attack you through your fears. Mm -hmm. Reuben name means behold ye a son. You know, so you're going to see one of the sons of Elohim. You know, remember who was called the son of Elohim, even, even Satan and his cronies, right? One of the sons of Elohim is going to come and lay with Bilhah the fearful. And it's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem amongst the flock. You know, now Genesis 49, 3 and 4 
um, tells us, it says, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, the excellency of power, unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then, thou, then defilest thou it. He went up to my couch. There was, it was not without consequence. You know, and this is why this is here, because in the very next passage, it's going to give you a rundown of his sons, but he wants you to know that this is, this is, this was not without consequence. When we go to 1 Chronicles 5, 1, it says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, then this in parentheses, it says, For he was the firstborn, but for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Yosef, the son of Israel. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. You understand? See, so now it's not about just being a son. It's not just about being the firstborn. You know, the one who replaced him was Ephraim. Remember what, what I told you to put on the shelf, right? You know, um, what y'all told us to do, be fruitful and multiply, right? You know, now guess who replaced Reuben? As the firstborn, Ephraim, whose name means doubly fruitful. You know, so it's not enough just to be a son, but you have to become fruitful as well. This is why the Messiah said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. You know, and that that it is Yah's will that you just that you bring forth um, fruit abundantly. That you bring forth much fruit. This is what Yah wants from us. He wants us to become fruitful. You know, it's not about the firstborn. In other words, it's not about your your race. It's not about, you know, what bloodline you were born into. You know, because because uh, Ephraim wasn't even Yaakov's biological son. It was his grandson. And he was half Egyptian. Amen? So it's not about race. It's about fruitfulness. Genesis 35, 23 through 29, and the sons of Leah, Reuben and Yaakov's firstborn, and Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Zebulun, the sons of Rachel, Yosef and Benjamin, and the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher. These are the sons of Yaakov, which were born to him in Padanaram. It, there's no, it, it's not by mistake that he tells us that before he gives the genealogy, of Yaakov. It's so that you can know and relate that Reuben not really the firstborn now. Right. Spiritually speaking. Verse 27, And Yaakov came unto Yisak, his father, unto Mamre, unto the city of Arba, which is Hebron, where Abram and Yisak sojourned. And the days of Yisak was a hundred and four score years. And Yisak gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Yaakov buried him. You know, um, said he was 104 score years, 100 speaks to the wow. children of promise, 80 to mouth for speech. And so we have the children of promise who goes, goes about and speaking, you know, the words of Elohim. You know, I'm going to stop right there. That's all I have for you today. Prayer was a blessing. Amen.